There's an old expression, a self-made man has a fool for a creator. You know, I tend to agree with that. When we become self-consumed, we get ourselves in trouble. Now, if you're going to lead others or simply go through life for that matter, well, you need wisdom, and it's particularly God's wisdom. So tell me, what does the Bible say about you, about me, and leaders needing God's wisdom? Let's see what the Bible says. A king needs God's wisdom. That's our lesson for today, based on 1 Kings chapter 3. A very important lesson. As I've already said, there's an old saying that goes, he who's a self-made man has a fool for a creator. And we need to be careful. We can become self-consumed, self-righteous, if you will. And we seem to think we have all the answers and we run ahead of God. We don't even have sense to get anybody's counsel sometimes. Sometimes we only want people who are messing up to advise us. Now that sounds a little weird, but what I'm referring to is the fact that we hang with a particular group who may not be successful, therefore we always feel successful because at least we're not as bad as they are. Well, that's not getting sound counsel. You need people who are wiser than you to move forward, to advance. And what greater source of wisdom is there than God? So yes, a king needs God's wisdom. And we'll look at it from the standpoint of wisdom's origin, its operation, and its outcome. Because when wisdom is active in your life, there is an outcome, and we want it. So a king's need for God's wisdom begins with wisdom's origin, as I say. So let's stop and think, what's happening as Solomon is assuming power over Israel? Because remember, that's what we've been talking about most recently. Now in Egypt, the other great world power of its day, there's a relatively new pharaoh or king in power, and he is Sunenes II. So under Sunenis II, Egypt has become, well, weak, and it needs an alliance. It really does. Uh, the first Sunenis, uh, his position was that he had built Israel, strengthened Israel, and now the younger comes in and tends to not be as strong a leader. Solomon, also a new ruler here in Egypt, Israel, well, he has a dangerous neighbor to deal with, Phineas. It's located to the north of the land. So Solomon needs to be prepared to deal with this. So he looks at a relationship between the two countries and he wants to ask the question, would this violate scripture? Because one of the things we've learned in earlier passages and we'll see in later passages, that Israel frequently gets in trouble when they intertwine with secular nations. Now this particular situation is somewhat unique and that although they build an alliance, which really becomes more of a relationship, there are not relationships going on amongst the people. They are not adopting the foreign gods of Egypt. They're not adopting the, the foreign ways of acting and living. They are maintaining their natural character as a nation of God's people, and that is significant. So since Solomon would not change his faith or permit idolatrous worship within Israel, this union would be a relationship, not an alliance, and it would be one that would be positive for God's people, and one that God would not have to judge. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. And Solomon made affinity, that relationship we're talking about, with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her unto the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and all the wall around Jerusalem round about it. So what's going on here? As part of this union, he marries the daughter of the Pharaoh and he brings her to his new home. But he's not actually ready to do that because his house is under construction, as is the house of God. Remember, he has been charged with that responsibility. His father couldn't do it. David couldn't do it. David provided a lot of the resources for it. But Solomon is actually having it constructed. It's under his leadership. 
So neither his house or the house of God is ready yet, and he brings his new bride home. And so since it's still finishing the construction process, they stay there in the city of David. Verse 2, only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. Why do you suppose that passage jumps in there with that little statement? Why is that significant? It's significant because they were not to build or worship up on the high places, up on the mountaintops. Why not? Because secular people built secular temples on the mountaintops and had statues to their false gods. And our God, the God of Israel, did not want to be seen or identified as just simply a secular God up on a mountaintop, placed there so that people would have to look up. No, God would dwell among his people. And so this little phrasing that we see in the scriptures is because of this they worshiped on the top. It's because they're waiting for God's house to be finished. So as a temporary quarters, if you will, they go and make sacrifice on the top of the temple. And so the people worship in the high place. And verse 3, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. So he is an honorable man who is obeying God and obeying the lessons he's learned. And only he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. Once again, we find that phrasing, only he sacrificed in the high places. Because we want to remember, this is not the normal thing that will take place long term. It's temporary. Verse 4, And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. Wow! In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. Now bear in mind he's taken all of these items, all of these things, to make all of these sacrifices. Part of that is because he is, of course, king. But you know, we have rulers in our own land, other nations, they don't put God first. They don't sacrifice anything for themselves. Solomon is doing precisely that. Solomon is making it public. The world can see, all his people of Israel can see that Solomon bows before God and makes sacrifices before God. So now in Gibeon, the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. Did you notice there was no limitations put on? He says, just tell me what you want. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, the great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness, this kindness of the nation, this kindness of the temple finally being built that thou hast given him a son to sit on this throne as it is this day. So in essence, he's not only thanking him for the way he blessed his father, David, he's also saying, by the way, one of the ways you blessed him is through me, his son. I sit on the throne of my father, David, and that in itself is a blessing. So let me ask you, do you ever wish God would do something like that for you? to bless you tremendously, to raise you up somehow, to just come to you and say, what would you like? What can I do for you? Ever thought about that as a question? Well, guess what? God has. Think of all the countless times he's told us, you know, come unto me. Think of the times he said, whatever we ask in faith believing, that I will do for you. In fact, the scripture says, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. That's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 15, a promise of God to you and to me. 1 Kings 3, verse 7, Solomon now says to God, and now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. So is he lifted up? Is he arrogant? Is he filled with pride? No, listen to this next phrase. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered for nor counted for the multitude. 
Give therefore thy servant Solomon an understanding heart to judge the people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this so great a people? Did you think of what he just said there? Solomon in essence said, look, I am weak, I'm young, I'm inexperienced. By the way, he was in his 20s. So he is being very honest, yes, I am young. But more than that, he's not filled with pride. He says, God, I need your help. I can't judge these people. I can't really know what's right or wrong up against so many people. He's saying, in essence, I need your help, God. Verse 10 tells us that the speech pleased the Lord, that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for yourself long life, nor have you asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked the life of your enemies, in other words, strike all these people down, take out the Egyptians, take out that northern country. No, God said you didn't do any of that. What you've asked for for yourself is understanding, to discern judgment. He says in verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. So there, there was none like thee before thee, nothing neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. God tells Solomon, there wasn't anybody before you that's as wise as you shall be right this moment forward, nor is anybody going to come that will be wise. That means you and I, however smart we think we are, how far we go, Solomon already got us beat because God said he would bless him with wisdom that exceeded the past or his future. Pretty special. Verse 13, God continues, And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked for. I think that's the way God does sometimes. We think we got these big grand plans. And then what we really begin to find out is that God is bigger than us. Not only can he answer bigger than we ask, but he has these larger plans. So don't try to confine God. Don't tie him up and put him in a little box. It doesn't work well that way. Identify what you see as a need, what you want to accomplish, what you want to do. Bring it to God and then ask him for his best. Use yourselves to God's glory and let God set the standard of how far and how high he will take you. So he says, as I say in verse 13, and I have also given thee that which you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And he was surrounded by other nations and other kings. And God just told him, because of your attitude, I can bless you, I can use you with riches and honor greater than any other king here. Verse 14, and if thou wilt walk in my ways, be faithful to God, to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. I'll give you a long life. That's what he says. If you are obedient. Let's be honest. It's not easy to be obedient. It's too easy to get caught up in our own life, our own world, our own ideas. And I think Solomon did that on occasion. It's interesting to look at the way God blessed him with wisdom, with wealth, with power. But his life, I would not describe it as extra long. And I think it's because there are times when we see Solomon, as strong as he is, sometimes operating in his strength. Got to be careful of that. It's a good lesson to learn. If God is working in your heart and life in a powerful way. Don't ever make the mistake of being self-consumed. Verse 15. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And by the way, when he says it's a dream, it's not like it's a fantasy, like it wasn't real. But he recognizes that God took those moments of silence during the time of his rest and gave the messages, the lessons, the answers to him and had this conversation. It was real, though in a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and he offers up burnt offerings and he offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. 
So the king needs God's wisdom. And now let's see wisdom's operation. Let's see how it actually works. Verse 16. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. Harlots. Why is that significant? Seems a bit odd to say the least. Of all the people who could come and benefit from the wisdom that God has placed in Solomon, why two basically prostitutes? I think it's to tell us something very important. It's easy for us to become self-righteous, to develop an attitude that somehow we are better, grander, because God loves us more than this world. Remember that God died for this world that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so the blessings of God are out there waiting for those who will respond to him. The wisdom of God, justice of God is needed for the weakest as well as what we think of as the strongest. So these two women who are hurting at this moment come to Solomon for wisdom that came from God. That's why I believe it's significant. Verse 17, the one woman said, O oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. What's he saying? We live in the same home and I had a baby. Verse 18, it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, I had a child, that this woman was delivered. She also had a child. And we were there together in the house. And there was no stranger with us in the house. She makes a point of that. And considering her trade, that makes sense that she wants to make that clear. Save we two that are in that house. Verse 19. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid. In other words, she rolled over in her sleep and the child suffocated. A, a terrible, terrible tragedy. And she arose at midnight, took my son from beside me, and while thy handmaid slept, while I was sleeping, she took my child to her bed and took her dead child and laid it there beside me. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, to behold, it was dead. But when I had considered in the morning, in other words, once this initial shock went past, thinking her child was dead, she said, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. She realized this is not my baby. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. What's going on? They're both denying the situation. They're both saying the other person took the child. Each is claiming the child for their own, and they're arguing back and forth in front of Solomon. Then said the king, the one saith, This is my son that liveth, and the son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the one that is dead, and my son living. He restates the matter before them and before all those that are watching and listening. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Sounds rather gruesome, sounds unbelievable that such a thing would happen. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned for her son. In other words, her, her, her whole inside just quaked and tore at the thought of her child being killed. And she says, oh my Lord, give her the living child. It's her child. But she's ready to give it up rather than let anything happen to this child and in no wise slay it. But the other said, ah, let it neither be mine nor thine, but go ahead, divide it. So the one woman can't imagine letting anything happen to the child. The other one doesn't care. Here's a question. Is a passage believable? Can you imagine any mother ever doing such a thing as just saying, go ahead, doesn't matter. I wish I could say it was unbelievable. I wish I could say such things would never happen. Let me share with you an article. It's about a year old. 
A South Texas woman is accused of selling her seven-year-old son and trying to sell two other young children, two little girls, ages two and three, to pay off a drug debt. That was carried in the Dallas News. You can see it on DallasNews.com. It's an amazing thing. But in the day in which we live for drugs, for money, for anything, a child's life doesn't always matter even to a mother. That is one of the many reasons we need to get the gospel out. We need to get the truth of God out. We need to teach the truth of what God says so that people's hearts will be changed and not blackened. So that people will understand that God values life and it is important and each life is sacred. How we could forget such a thing is beyond me, but it happens. So look, oh, wisdom's origin, wisdom's operation, finally, wisdom's outcome. The king answered, and he says this, give her the living child. The mother that was saying, oh, let's just make sure the child is alive, give it to her. She said, no, give her, that woman, the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. Wonder why that would be a fearful thing, something that demanded respect. I think it's because they realized when God's man, is operating with the wisdom and the direction of God, you're not going to hide things. The lies will come out. The light will come on a situation, and the truth will show. A great value or application of a Christian is the wisdom that God has put in their life. If you work for somebody, that employer has something special. If you make a decision as a Christian to be faithful to God, and ask him for his wisdom in the decisions and in the walk of your life. James chapter 1, 5 and verse 6 say this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. What's that upbraideth not business? He says, have you ever asked somebody for help on something or you asked them to explain something? And, to, and instead of really helping you, what they do instead is say, you don't know how to do that? Oh, goodness. Well, d don't you know anything? That's upbraiding, tearing you down when all you did was ask for help. God doesn't upbraid you. It says, it shall be given him. That person who says, God, give me wisdom, and he will give it to you. And the Bible says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So understand this. When we ask of God wisdom, understanding, the way to do it so that it will honor him, and we don't do it with doubts, with hesitation, but with the confidence that our God, who so loves us, will also give us leadership and wisdom and understanding. When that happens, we can trust that he will bless us with wisdom and understanding. Remember, we need the stability and the wisdom of God. And the world needs God's message through you and through me. We're God's children. We are his representative ambassadors for Christ. And this world needs us to live like it. Have you got a question? Send your question to ask at askthepastornow.com. That's ask, A-S-K, at askthepastornow.com. And remember that through Christ, you can succeed. God bless you.